Good morning, everyone. Why share your faith? That's the question for the day. The passage we're going to use is Deuteronomy. Remember, Deuteronomy is the last, the farewell sermons of Moses in the last year of his life. Three long sermons, well, one longer than the others. Moses is 120 years old. Caleb and Joshua are probably 80 years old. And everybody else there is younger. So these three senior citizens, remember the population that left Egypt? And we're told that they were going to not get to the promised land? So we have a new generation. I'll call them the children of those who left Egypt. There's something important about raising your children to fear God. Because now we are at a stage where the children of Israel are about to enter the promised land. And they are indeed the children of Israel. They do not have that mindset of where they came from in Egypt. That generation has passed. Sometimes my analogy will be an immigrant based analogy. And I would say, sir, as I look around the room, except for individuals who have Native American heritage and myself, everyone could probably think about their immigrant ancestors. You might not know who they are, but there's an immigrant who made a decision to leave the old country. Have you heard of the immigrant mindset? There is something called the immigrant mindset. And when you're an immigrant, it's hard to get rid of it. Even when you're 85 or 90 years old, you still have the mindset. You know where you came from. And you know where you've come to. The children of Israel do not have that background. And imagine their children, when they cross into Canaan, the promised land. There will be no recall eventually. Unless you tell the story. Unless you insist on telling them where they came from. They might just decide we blend in and therefore we don't have to care about our past. And there's a cliche, I think it's related to Judaism or the Jewish heritage, not heritage, um, experience, that if you don't know your history, you're likely to repeat it. Deja vu all over again. And some of us make the same mistake more than once. And that's a shame. <laughs> but sometimes it's a different day. And we don't realize it's the same set of circumstances because it's a different day. And we're in a different mood. And we make the same mistake. Man, I can't believe I fell for that twice. <laughs> or three times. So this is the background. The children of Israel are about to enter the promised land. Moses is telling them, I'm not allowed to go in. God has not granted me license to clearance to go in. Joshua will be your new leader. He will take you across the Jordan. And the battles that need to be fought, God will be your shield and defender. God will fight these battles. But it only takes one generation for your children to decide they no longer want to deal with God. And the heritage and the legacy that you have could end because your children decide no mass. We don't want this. And I'm sure it breaks many parents' hearts. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Sadly, some parents work hard to raise their children in the faith, and the children turn their backs. The children of Israel turn their back on God many times, even though when Moses preached to them, Insistently, he said, you will not turn your back on God. He said, no, we will not. No, we are not going to do that. But we know the rest of the story and how often they did. And we know that the history of Israel after it split from Judah was a history of rebellion. And all of the kings under the kingdom of Israel are called bad kings. And several of the kings under the kingdom of Judah are called good kings. But you never know where this thing is going to go. There is a practice that you have to put in place daily, insistently seeking to serve the Lord. And I will say that 
the world has changed and the older generation sometimes feels as though we have done our part and we need to step back. I think that is one of the saddest things we could do, especially in the church. I have nothing against young leaders. Hello, Captain. <laughs> but I think that older people need to be visible. Children need to grow up in a church where they see the older people doing things and the older people interacting with them. So if I were the Corps Sergeant Major or the Corps Officer, I would have someone senior on the platform apart from the Corps Sergeant Major every Sunday so the children get a mindset. We value multi-generations. We value family. And that there's something important that the older generation can pass on. A part of the problem is that the younger generation generally has, on average, more education because that's how culture evolves. We educate our children. The, the old cliche is we put our children on our shoulders so they can be giant killers, help them to be taller. We want our children to do better than we do. But at some stage, those children need to hold the older generation with respect, in respect and understand that there is something valuable that's being passed on. Even if that generation doesn't have the schooling, the academic schooling, there's something very valuable. So I think that it is great that we are still a multi-generational church, but I think more of the multi-generational experience needs to be had. So that my three children, for example, will grow up knowing who the seniors are, and will be able to look back at their lives and say, well, you know, so-and-so put his hand on my shoulder and said this to me. What stories are they going to tell if they don't get to interact with the older generation? So I'm going to ask you kindly. I'm not going to say mentor somebody. But think about this. How can I offer something to someone in that younger cohort? It could be a family member. They will remember you. Or it could be my children. <laughs> they come here every Sunday. But pass something on so that they will look back 30, 40 years from now, I say, we understand the importance of somebody came alongside with my parents and reinforced. The Sunday school teachers do that. But we want to make sure that we have this intergenerational experience. I want to put in an ad that adds to what you're saying. There are specific ways we can serve in those capacities that we're trying to be intentional that need a little bit more love and care from adults, really. We've tried this with a prayer partner initiative, which will continue, but we're going to have lots of boys and girls coming up to that age this next year, that middle school age, who are going to be needing prayer partners this year. And the success of that, really, is on the adults in that relationship, that initiate conversation and encourage their person. And then Sunday school, we're always looking for substitute teachers and teachers for these Sunday school teachers. Would you like to teach the class? I just want to say, here no, you go. I'm going to quote her several times Sign today. Up. <laughs> Last week, Kathy Catherine preached a sermon. I tried to compliment her. She did not receive a compliment. I didn't know. So I just ignored it. <laughs> I thought it was one of the best sermons I've heard her preach. Amen. Thanks. And I called it a Bob Face sermon. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know how to do with that. He's one of my favorite people. You go home thinking about it. All week long I've been thinking about what she said. And she tickled my funny bone, well, my fancy, academically, because she mentioned a study by a sociologist at the University of North Carolina, a study of teenagers. And the book is called Soul Searching. The bottom line is this. The children who are growing up in the church don't look very different than the children who are growing up in the world. That's sad. That's sad. But thankfully, we have intentionally put a ministry in here called Student Ministries where we can touch them multiple times. But they go out in the world and the world rubs off on them. A few years ago, someone said to me, be careful, there's something called home language and outside language, and your children will speak both languages. <laughs> I don't want them to be multilingual that way. I prefer for them to learn another language. But she said, yeah, they will learn the language out there, and they'll come home and they'll give you the language you want. They'll be aware of that language. I guess I can't do much about that. And then Carol said something last week as well that stayed with me. She said, there's only so much I can do for my children. 
within the household, but they had to interact with the rest of the world. I'm calling on all of you to be aware that we are multi-generational. We are intentionally multi-generational. Let's do something to pass that on. Plant the seed. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say something to them. I was, because the theme is why I should share my faith, and the passage is more inside the church sharing of faith, sadly, because we're talking about the children of Israel on the bank of the River Jordan, getting their last instructions from Moses about how they need to make sure their children maintain the relationship they have with God. I would say the direct application would be us making sure that the children in this court maintain their relationship with God. But it goes beyond sharing your faith or reflecting God within the Christian community. It's reflecting God in our entire lives. I'll try to stay as close to the theme of reflecting God here because it's, I think, a little easier. If I had to say the takeaway or the application is, the application will be easier if I say, find a kid and mentor that kid, or find a kid and say something positive to that kid. Obviously with the parent's permission, because of say from harm and all kinds of things, you don't want to violate any protocols, but mentor somebody. Pray for somebody. Care deeply for somebody's grandkid, so to speak. Because as Moses is telling the children of Israel, you will continue, right? To be faithful to God, right? When you get the promise. Yeah, we will. And we know the story. We need to do what we need to do. To make sure that they can say, so and so planted in my life when I was 10 years old. And that kept me connected to God. Because sometimes parents will preach at the children. And I, another Captain Catherine comment from last week. When I asked my children, I'm quoting her, did you brush your teeth? I'm not sure I can believe them. <laughs> when I ask my children, are you doing what is right and pleasing before God? I want to believe them. But if somebody else asks them a question, I think that sometimes we think it's okay within the family to let our hair down, so to speak. Our family will keep the secrets of our not so great behavior. But how do we fake it outside of there so that other people seeing us will think one thing. You want to show your best to me and to the world, but at home, the people who love you and know you will know when you're not at your best. The bottom line point is this. We must be intentional. And the easiest thing, I think, is for us to share our faith by showing others within the Christian community of which we are a part, that we care, we love, and we understand the relationship we have with God, and we want to model this for them. Okay, that's enough preaching. <laughs> I was trying to find a theme to go with the lesson beyond why you should share my faith. And uh, I went through my songbook, the old one under the section Witness, and I copied several of the songs, the first line of those songs, because, again, you want to ask the question. So is landscape, if you have it, it is this way. The songs. But on the back side of that, for some of you, you might have to look at the person next to you. I was going to make three comments to start the lesson. The first one is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. So maybe I'm on the back of the handout, if something's on the back. Otherwise, the person sitting next to you has that on the back. Okay, the first comment is from... Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 and it says do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen <coughs> the second comment is from St. Francis of Assisi who says share the gospel at all times and if necessary use words <laughs> The third comment is from I don't know whom. If Christians do not act according to their beliefs, not only is their salvation questionable, but the credibility of their personal witness to non-Christians is greatly diminished. 
we have to be very conscious of what we say and what we don't say. So again, a song I try to remember. I wrote it down as well. Give me a second here. It says something about they're listening to your, not listening to your talk, but watching your walk. They're judging by your actions every day. It's an old song, and I don't know if anyone knows it. People aren't hearing what you say, they're watching what you do. They're not listening to your talk, they're watching your walk, they're judging your actions every day. And if you think about that, so here's another quick story. I had a colleague who, whenever he got out of his car in front of this large building, walking to the building, he would quicken his pace. If nobody was around, he would walk leisurely. But if he was walking toward this building, he kept thinking, there are probably a couple of hundred people looking through the window. And I'm going to walk very determined and very purposefully. <laughs> he said, why do you do that? He never answered. But I observed that there was a difference in his gait if he thought people were watching him versus not watching him. Never forgot that. People are watching. A sermon I heard when I was seven years old, the title of the sermon was, Look Out Somebody Saw. And my brother wrote it on the window sill. And it stayed there for years. And I was afraid to look out the window because I kept thinking, so what if somebody is seeing me in my bedroom? Look out somebody saw. Why should I share my faith? I'm going to start the session at the top of the handout. If you can find that, we'll get started. And I want you to keep thinking of that immigrant mindset. Some of you, will, it'll be hard for you to do that, but we're going to talk about that a little bit. <coughs> Deuteronomy contains Moses' farewell sermons to the children of Israel. In chapters 1 to 3, Moses reminded them that God had delivered their parents and grandparents from slavery in Egypt and preserved them throughout a generation of wilderness wandering, 40 years. In chapter 4, he reassured this new generation that God would be with them and would prosper them in the land of promise. However, they needed to be faithful to the covenant. You know what the covenant is. We call it the old covenant, but nevertheless. In chapter 5, Moses rehearsed the Ten Commandments as the essence of God's covenant with his people. And this week we are focused on chapter 6. The scripture focus summarizes the heart of the law in what Jews call the Shema, the Hear, O Israel. Today's session looks at what Moses had to say to the children of Israel about sharing their faith. Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew chapter 28 verse 90. And that applies to us. Our lives must be a witness. Both our walk and our talk must express what we know about God based on our experience with him. So the song I chose is just the chorus. It says, I want to sing it. I want to shout it. I want to tell you all about it. The love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. It brings the glory to my soul. And to quote Captain Catherine last week, it's rip-roaring. I want to sing it. I want to shout it. I want to tell you all about it. The love of Jesus. Okay, enough of that. I can't compare it. I want to share it. I feel I really must declare it. The love of Jesus, the love of Jesus. It brings the glory to my soul. Amen? You want to share it. You need to want to share it. Even if it is come alongside a kid and say something encouraging to that kid. We have to share our faith. We have to be intentional. We have to make sure that people know that we are witnessing to them. If we are intentional, I think we will be more purposeful in our witness. It might mean spending an extra minute to talk to somebody, but you don't know the value of planting that seed down the road. So we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's two parts, verses 1 through 9, and then 20 through 25. Let us take a look at what Moses told the children of Israel in those first few (coughs) verses. Well, actually, let's go to the Shema itself, the hero of Israel, starting at verse 4. He said, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Let's come back to that in a moment. How do you put the commandment on your heart? He says in verse 7, impress them on your children. Then he says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Verse 8, he says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames and on your gates. He's basically saying, whatever it takes, figure it out. But let your younger people know what God commands and what God requires. And it's probably a little showy to walk around with this box or this whatever on your hand or on your forehead. And I'm not clear how many people actually did that. I know that there's some Orthodox Jews who would sew it into the, some part of their garment. I think it's an ephod or something like that. They sew the commandments, the little box there. It's a very, a very La- Thank you very much. Say that word again. Phylactery. I said something else that was wrong. <laughs> I'm so glad you all helped me out and keep me grounded. <laughs> Sharing our faith is about more than what we say. I think we all agree. So let's ask the question again. How do you share your faith beyond words? What could you do or what do you do? Say something that would be helpful to me or to somebody else about a tactic, if you want to call it that, or a technique or a practice that helps you to evangelize through your lifestyle or nonverbal evangelism. Eddie, I'm intentional. When we go shopping together mm-hmm. and we go in the checkout together, Gina is always, always saying, I don't know how I did something, put up with this girl or something like that. He's always being funny and I'm, I'm ready for it. And I say, you know, how are we doing this? How do you think we've done this for 58 years? <laughs> 58 years, they say. Yeah. How could you do it? I says, well, it takes three in our marriage. Mm-hmm. And I'm off and running. You know, I'm going to throw in my favorite verse right now. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always yeah. be ready to give an answer to those who yeah. ask you the yeah. reason for the hope you have. Sometimes you have to do that in their face. And it's not in their face. You're having your private conversation. <laughs> so here's a quick story. I was sitting with a friend having a conversation. And we talked for like 20 minutes and then somebody at the next table commented on what we were saying. I'm thinking, oh dear. I hope I have not been a terrible witness. She has heard every word because I was not aware of my surroundings. She heard every, or maybe she just had supersonic hearing. And she commented on some of the things we said. And I kept thinking, Lord, I hope I've said the right things. Well, I kind of said that Joe Olstein will be the country's pastor one day, and I hate to think that. <laughs> Where we would all be getting pop psychologies and calling it religion one day. That's the point of it. But for those of you who love Joe Olstein, I apologize. That's what I said. And <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> I, I have found over my many years that uh, when Kensington first opened, a lot of people left the churches and went to Kensington, especially single, single middle-aged adults. And many of them have drifted back to their own churches because uh, Kensington was new, it was bright, it was shiny, and popular, and they met their current husband there a lot of times. But they were seeking more, and I feel that way about Joel Olstein. I have neighbors who watch Joel Olstein, and I have to be very careful what I say, because my opinion of Joel is that he's pretty light. But that's where they are, and he's reaching them. And God puts in us a hunger for himself, and he's going to lead them and direct them to want more, if they themselves want more. So, you know, those who watch Joel Osteen, I'm happy they're at least watching. Mm-hmm. I, I was basically telling you what I said, I was confessing, mm-hmm. but Booth, William Booth, the founder of this great Salvation Army, if I can say that, was not intending to start a church. No. So people just weren't accepted in the church, so there was, he was stuck with it. But he was <coughs> okay, get saved and go on to the church. 
the church doesn't want us because we are not. When your when your ministry is among prostitutes and alcoholics in the gutter, the church doesn't. I hate to say that, the church doesn't want it. At that point, the church. It wasn't just the, the alcoholics that he dealt with. He went down for the down and outers who didn't smell well. And this was in a day when you bought your pew, and he would lead his people right up front and sit mm-hmm. them in the first pew, regardless of who owned the pew. <laughs> Almost every week. But, you know, we have seats. Mr. Smith is up. What what is worked with me is first off the idea from God that I'm here for a purpose. His plan. So it just somehow evolved to the point where when I wake up in the morning, there's a number of things I do out of habit. I thank him for my sleep. I ask him if today you have someone that's going to cross paths with me and help me to be aware that this is from you. And then the whole thing of let this mind be you, the mind that was in Christ. So that Bach not my words come out, but his words, that he touches me to do what he wants in this simple situation. And a lot of things have evolved from that. Uh, I happen to have a full business and I have to go to the post office a lot. Okay, my dad taught me to be a gentleman. Open the door for people. Okay, I can do that, but I can also say, have a blessed day. Not just have a, have a good day, have a blessing. And often people will say, Wow, that's a nice thought. Something to generate a little thing. And and uh, periodically I say, well, Are you a person of faith? Yes, I am. Wow, that's nice to meet you. Now, that's maybe not sharing the gospel, but it could be another Christian who now, wow, that's a nice thing. I can do the same thing. I can begin to pass these little things on. God made it very clear. He says, my word's not good. And boy, you may not be the reaper, but boy, I sure need some people to throw seeds out there and throw a lot of them out there. And then I'll be responsible for growing them. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of where the lesson is supposed to be because it is within the community. So sometimes you say something to encourage someone who needs encouragement. You can't look at their face and tell they need the encouragement. But figure out something that you can say that would be encouraging because you don't know the pain that the person sitting next to you is necessarily feeling. But give them a chance to connect with you. And while you were speaking, I thought of a chorus. I tried to look it up. It says, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I... Humbly do my part to win that soul, or even encourage that soul. So I'd like that to run song. <coughs> Rescue the perishing. Amen. I would just say to add on to Bob's analogy there, connecting Deuteronomy and the sower parable. This, I feel like Deuteronomy is it's preparing the soil. You know, like if, if the soil is prepared to be planted, in the likelihood of it growing, of it catching young people or adults. If the soil is prepared properly, they're going to receive the word. Question number four. Why do you suppose Moses said, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey? Or as the New King James says, be careful to observe. Why do you suppose he said that? Moses is the great grandfather type now, 120 years old, talking to people 40 and younger. Okay, get the visual. The senior citizen talking to younger people. Here. He has been watching them for how many years? 40 years of walking through. They do a lot of, uh, they need to listen a little bit to care. He's seen every last one of them birthed, and now he says, okay, I know your parents, I know your family. It's his own heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
also Moses knew what happened when you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Remember the waters at Marah? Yeah. Remember the times they said, let's go back to Egypt. Their parents said that. Yeah. Oh, you brought us there to die? <laughs> he says, you know, your parents weren't always obedient. Here, O oh Israel, be careful. Here, be careful. Obey. Well, Moses, interesting? Moses himself was not obedient. Well, that's right. Wrong. Yeah. There's a consequence to that. That's another great comment too, because you want to say, "Well, I don't want you to make the same mistakes I made." And then God said, "Speak to the rock," and I struck the rock. God said, "Okay, well, you're not going into the Promised Land, you know." But I say Moses got a free pass to heaven right there. You know, he didn't have to go into the Promised Land. So I don't feel badly for Moses that the 120 year old guy didn't get to cross the Jordan River. He stand there. Although there's something great about crossing the Jordan and claiming that land for God. But Joshua was a young man, 80 years old. <laughs> so a younger leader. Yes. Even, even when, when they thought they were obeying the law, well, us too, sometimes we're not really obeying the law. I love we're, that. We're, we're, I love that. We're stretching the truth there. I love that. And be so you have to be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. In other words, ask yourself, did I get that right? You know how many times I mess up because I think somebody, I love dearly, says something and they're saying something else? And I realize that I need to ask the question, is that what you meant or is that what you said? So I don't go off and do things thinking I heard correctly. And maybe it's a male genetic thing. Uh, it works for women too. <laughs> I'm in the process of knitting a sweater. I very carefully read the instructions. Men don't do that, by the way. <laughs> and yet, the other day I had to rip out six rows because I made a major mistake six rows back. Sometimes we read the instructions in Scripture, we think we know what we're doing. And yet we still stick our own will in the middle of it and do something that's not right. Because we're human. Because we're human. And uh, that's not a good excuse. Why? That's what I've got. Because, because we're we want our way. We want to be in control. Yeah. Control. We want. When I went to. Uh, I mentioned Marinette, Wisconsin. Um, when I was in Marinette, one day it was out. I had been down in Green Bay doing something with. Um, the teens down there. And I had on a Salvation Army sweatshirt that had the crest on it. And of course, right across the crest, it says blood and fire. And I was checking out at, Wal at Walmart, the one and only big store in Marinette, by the way. <laughs> and um, the guy said, blood and fire? That sounds awful gory. And I said, oh no, it's wonderful. We're talking about the blood of Jesus that was shed so that you and I can have salvation and the fire of the Holy Spirit that brightens up our life because we have a way to talk with God. Now, that was the only part of the conversation I was able to have with him because the person, I, he was done checking me out. I had to make it short and sweet. But the next week when I came back, he says, I'm going on break. Can you come with me? What? And he asked her out on a date. <laughs> and this guy was maybe all of 20. <laughs> I don't go for a um, But we went back and had a discussion while he had his 15 minute coffee break. And uh, he says, I'm going to go back to my church and talk to my pastor about this because what you said makes a whole lot of sense. Sometimes you just lay it out there. T-shirts can be a witness. <laughs> I'm glad you said that too because I talked about other things and T-shirts obviously, garments can say something. Uh, uniform is always appropriate. Yes. <laughs> so, just to keep that multi-generational idea going for a minute, and I don't have many minutes left, but younger generations, are they easy to communicate with? Not you can get their computers out of their <laughs> <laughs> or speak their language. So you understand that Moses had this 
texting generation to talk to and they're not really listening to anything he's saying. That's why he's emphasizing. Hear, listen, and obey. I need to get your attention. This is important what I want to tell you. Follow the commands of the Lord because there's a promise associated with it. And the promise he, he said was, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and you will increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So there is a promise. And when you disobey, there are consequences. Like there are consequences for sin. So be aware that these things tie together. And even if I can't get you to lift your face from your texting thing, I'm going to keep at it. That's why we need to figure out how to communicate with that generation. I'm not saying to go get a smartphone, Major Linda, but I'm saying find a way. We need to find a way to be in their sphere so they think about us. They should be able to say, my children, for example, should be able to say, yeah, so-and-so spoke to me and told me this thing. I said, really? Okay. As if I put you up to it. But still, we need to be multi-generational and intentional so that we make sure that we communicate. Because you plant that seed. The Apostle Paul said that he was planting, Apollos was watering, but the increase is coming from God. That's the challenge that we understand. God wants us to do this. I'm almost out of time, but I want to get a couple more questions here. So in question number five, I said, verse two says that if the people who heard Moses' sermon that day kept the commands and the laws and decrees of God, the children and grandchildren would fear the Lord. How do the things we say and do affect our family or our friends or acquaintances or strangers? Are we intentional in what we say? So we talked about when you pray, you say, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul for me. Or make sure that you've chosen the words you're going to say. It might appear accidental, but it's more incidental. But you were intentional. I'm going to witness to somebody today. So I'm going to figure out and ask the Lord to give me the words to say. So we observe the situation and say something that's helpful. But we know that we are ready to witness. Whether it's by wearing the t-shirt. It's amazing how you can decide, I'm going to wear this t-shirt today. Lord, use this t-shirt to witness to somebody. Intentional witness. Comment? Today's lesson. Why share your faith and what you just said there. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of you just a little bit of help for me. Yesterday, I opened a dialogue with Denny McLean. Denny's made a lot of mistakes in his life. And... Uh, the sports community has pretty much turned their backs on him because of it. But we started this dialogue yesterday, and I'm hoping that he and I can follow through with this. He's hurting right now, and I think he's vulnerable to, to put down his pride and to accept Christ. So if you will pray for this situation, I think there's a soul that's available to Christ. Because of just, just a little encounter yesterday and some dialogue back and forth and his reaction to it. So if you could do that for me, I would appreciate it. And we don't want to seem opportunistic, but we want to grab the opportunity when the Lord makes it available to us. And if somebody doesn't come along and say something helpful, then the opportunity could be missed. And the Lord will place you in that situation. And you remain silent. And then you say, I wish I'd said something. I'm not saying to speak if you feel afraid to speak, but there are ways to witness. When we go out, be intentional about witnessing. Question number nine says, how might these verses speak to the responsibility we have to share our faith? I think we do have a responsibility. The Lord commands that we do this. Question number 11, why was the story of the Exodus so important to the people and their relationship with God? The story of the Exodus. Moses is saying, God brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Why is this story so important to the people? As you think of your own world, what would be the equivalent of coming out of Egypt for all of us? Our salvation. Our salvation. Leaving a world of sin nature, whether we were a terrible sinner or not, sin nature, and saying, I'm going to leave that behind. 
That's why I keep saying our testimony needs to be on the tip of our tongue. Always be ready. And if you haven't written it out, three sentences is all you need. Here's what it used to be. Here's what happened. I'm happy in Christ today. Something that would witness, would connect to somebody. Every Christian should have at least a three sentence testimony. Past, present, future, and the hope. If you haven't written it out, practice writing it out. Then practice saying it so that you're ready to give that answer. So the challenge. I want you to think of ways in which you will share your personal faith story with people outside of your family. Find a way this week to share your personal find, faith story. How do you find a way and how in the university when you teach? Oh, I announced in the very first day of class whether anybody gets in trouble or not. I said, you know, in my Sunday school class, which is mainly senior citizens, sorry, <laughs> 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 I start that way. I open the door. And then five kids will come and be, oh, Professor, you're a Christian. So, a little tack, I would say. Never been challenged. No, never. I've never been challenged. Because the Lord has made a way. And I'm glad He has. And I'm not saying there won't be an obstacle in the future, but I think that I have to be intentional. So, on Monday, a new term starts. And that's my segue in. By the way, this is who I am. Uh, the Lord's impressed on me my three arenas for witness. The first is family, the extended family. The second is the core band. And the third is my neighbors. My, my neighborhood. Last song. We are witnesses for Jesus. In the haunts of sin and shame, in the underworld of sorrow where men seldom hear his name, to bind the brokenhearted and their liberty proclaim. We are witnesses for Jesus. Do some witnessing for Jesus. Words that ever you may be. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to be effective witnesses. Help us to rely on your <laughs> grace and your mercy as we tell others about you. As a good news message, as we share our faith, as we talk about what you have done for us, what you can do for the whole who are Thank you again for Jesus' yes. sacrifice on the cross. And may we be pleased to identify with Jesus as we go into the world to share the good news. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.